Thanks, Nicole. Let's just uh, lower those expectations before I start. Uh, she forgot the operative word was a stand-up comedian. Um, now I'm a strategic designer. Um, either that or I just Googled it and shopped the look. Um, <laughs> pretty much how it works. Um, thank you for having me, Nicole. Um, she actually asked me a few weeks ago if I could do this talk and I said, I'll do it but on three conditions. I said, one, can I bring my drunk easel along? She said, yeah, go on. So he's over here today. <laughs> I said, two, can you get a local street artist to smear a sad Max Brenner on the backdrop? She did all right there. <laughs> I said, three, can you fill the room with Sydney's greatest bubbling talent of creatives? beautiful people who want to learn and grow. And you know what? Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> That's a joke! Uh, all right, cool. So um, I'm going to talk about flow today. Um, I met Claire uh, before the talk. She goes, oh, this is my favourite topic. Can you pronounce the psychologist's name that came up with a theory? Um, I could, I just don't want to. Um, no, when, the thing is, when I was thinking about flow, right, oh, it works, ooh, that's nice. Um, I didn't do heaps of research, I'll be honest, right? There's a lot of stuff you can read online, there's some really inspiring TED Talks about getting in the flow state. Uh, for me, the value I can bring to this is my own experiences, my own perspectives, um, hard won. And uh, that's, that's what I'm going to share with you today. So I just want to start with a, a bit of a definition. For me, right, flow is that free movement of information between nodes in a network. That's a really fucking boring sentence, all right? That's not what I'm going to talk about for the next half hour. Um, but it is where I'm going to start, right? Because I thought about this idea of flow between the nodes, right? And I reflected on my career, my own experiences. And I've had a pretty wonky career, right? That's why I dress like people would expect me to, because it makes it easier to fit into that bucket. You got more credibility this way. If I came in with a funny shirt and said, oh, I used to be a comedian, no one's letting me transform their business. Right? <laughs> um, so I started off as a stand-up comedian. Uh, I started off as a fetus, but worked my way <laughs> into stand-up comedy. Uh, I did that for 10 years, right? It's an amazing experience. It's... Um, it's pretty fucking hard, but um, very rewarding, right? But the thing is, when you're a comedian, everything is about looking in. Like, you look out, you pick up from the people around you, but it's about looking in. Everything goes through this filter in your head that goes, oh, is there something in that? You know, every conversation you have, every interaction, every event you see goes through, and you end up quite inward looking. After 10 years, I kind of got sick of looking in and wanted to look out, branch out, try something else, right? Became a copywriter in a creative agency. All of a sudden, I was teamed up with someone else, right? An art director. And what we do is work every day to build on each other's ideas. And things would grow. You would get to more interesting places more quickly by building on each other. I kind of got jack of selling the margarine dreams, right? So I pr started producing some little products, right? Designing some little ideas. And I teamed up with an engineer, an industrial designer, to help get them ready for manufacture and shipping, right? And suddenly I was teamed up with two people with very different perspectives to my own, that thought differently, that came from different backgrounds. And it was amazing to see how quickly we worked together, how fast things progressed. And we ended up in some pretty weird spaces. It wasn't just solving the problems that we were already working on. But, you know, after about a year, I remember sitting in a room and we're trying to work out how we can use skin as a... Um, input for information. How could we put eyes in the back of someone's head by putting feedback through their skin, right? That was never my plan, right? That's a pretty wonky spot to get to in a conversation. But we got there because we had these three very different minds in the room. I started working more in corporate innovation, in, I guess design, it's a nice umbrella term, right? And in doing that, I kind of trained up in design thinking, right? And been running these workshops in the side. All of a sudden, I was the facilitator. I was no longer in that creative ideation space. I was helping other people build on each other's ideas. And if you've ever been in those workshops, if you've ever run one, 
it's crazy, right? You've got all these people that have known each other for so long. All of a sudden, in the right conditions, they can start building, getting to places that they've never thought of with the person that they've been sitting next to for 10 years, right? And you get to these transformative spaces from people just because they're in the right conditions. And in the last year, I've started looking at uh, social movements, you know, speaking to people, learning, understanding the theories behind it. And for me, that's a crazy example of people working together, right? Because you've got all this, this huge distributed network, not in one place, right? But by sharing information and working together, they enact huge social change. And so when I was thinking about, I suppose, these progressions, made me realise that for me, flows, like, the boring nodes between network, like, I don't want to talk about that, but the flow between people in a group, right? When people are exchanging information freely in a group, something amazing happens. Like, this is you, right? It's not a very accurate representation, but ostensibly this is you, right? Everything you've ever done, ever experienced, ever seen, felt, tasted, thought is inside that circle. And so when you're thinking creatively, you're reaching as far as you can into this set of experiences and ideas to jam things together and come up with something new. And that's amazing because you have had shitloads of experiences in your life, right? But the things outside that circle that you haven't experienced, that you don't know, you can never bring them in. You can never combine them with what you know to come up with a new idea. You know, there's that thing you um, imagine a new colour. Right? It's a really fucking hard thing to do, right? Because it's out here. You don't know about any other colours. What happens, though, when you team up with other people... You've got more experiences, more thoughts, more ideas to draw from. And when we're working in a group, one of two things happen, right? In the wrong conditions, we get consensus. You know that feeling where you sit around, someone introduces an idea or a problem, you talk, and eventually you end up in a point where no one's really happy, but at least you don't disagree on the fundamentals, right? That's how we get to real boring ideas. But in the right conditions, all these experiences, all these ideas, all these perspectives, they can come together. And when we share the extremities of what we know and what we understand and what we've seen, we start to create these gaps in our knowledge. And by working out the difference between here and here, we start to fill new space when we grow and we build on each other's ideas and we borrow other people's perspectives and expand, we don't just get smarter as individuals, but we actually create this system of understanding, this shared knowledge, and it's greater than anything that we're capable of on our own. And this is what I want to talk about today. Because when we're being creative, yes, we can come up with amazing ideas. But when we work together, we're capable of more than anything we could do on our own. And we like to think about that one person right in the middle, you know. Oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. We think about the great movements and ideas of the past and we get drawn into one person because it's easier to stick that narrative to one single person, right? But Steve Jobs wasn't a genius. He created the conditions for genius to occur. You know, Rosa Parks didn't end segregation in the United States. She was part of a vast network of individuals all working together to change the game. Greta Thunberg is not going to save us from climate change, right? unless she's like Captain Planet 2.0. It's very unlikely that she is our saviour. But what she has done is create a space for all of us to contribute you know, a space in our minds, a space in our conversations where we can all come to the party and all give our bit, share ideas and hopefully get to a space that saves us from the apocalypse. Right. Fingers crossed. And so today, I want to talk about creating the conditions for change. And that's kind of the kicker, right? The conditions for flow, right? Because you can't create flow, you can only create the conditions that are conducive to flow. I'm going to talk about it through the lens of comedy, design, and movements. The three things I want to talk about today are presence, behaviours, and tension. Right? 
I'm going to give it a little bit more colour in a second. Uh, these are three ways that you can start to create flow within a group, start to create that environment where information can be transferred, where we can get into a flow together, build on each other's ideas and create that shared understanding. There's actually heaps more of stuff that we can do, you know, trust, humility, empathy, tangibility. There's a lot of shit to get this right, but these are three kind of fundamentals that hopefully you guys can all take away and apply to your work and start moving in the right direction. So the first one is presence, and presence is... Um, <laughs> It's a rare trait these days, right? You know, there's people here on their phone looking up probably the real definition of flow. I get it, right? There's better answers out in the ether. Um, and that's cool, right? But that's just the way we work now, right? Um, but the thing is, presence is kind of focusing on the here and now to the exclusion of all that other stuff, right? Yes, like, my kid's sick, yes, like, money's tight, my boss is annoying, it's hot, I really want those new shows, shoes. That's all the other shit that's going on in your life. When you're present, all of a sudden you stop thinking about that stuff and your energy is channeled towards a group. And so if we can create presence, then all of a sudden that energy is running into the work we're doing rather than away from it. And that's why it's so important, it's a real fundamental, right, if you want to create flow. And there's a lot of different ways that this can be done, right? Comedians are great at it. Hands up, have you been to a comedy gig before? All right, keep your hand up if you remember the MC. Right. No one remembers the MC. He's a boring guy that comes out. Hey, how you going? Toilets are over there. This is how comedy works. Like, yeah, mate, hurry up, get on with the jokes, right? But he actually, he or she, has a really important job, right? And their job is to bring you into the room. Because you're all disparate people, right? You've all got different lives, different experiences. You're not united. You just happen to be in the same space. Their job is to bring you into the room. And the way they do that is super simple, right? Hey, what's going on? It's Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is Saturday night, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh it's good to be out, isn't it? Hey, away from everything. <laughs> yeah, that's so true, away from everything else. Yeah, we're here. Oh. Oh, and check out this wall. How black is it, hey? Oh, yeah, the wall is so black, right? All of a sudden, he's taken the things that are in your life and pushed them out of the way and got you to focus on where you are in this moment, right? Super subtle, super simple. That's why I'm talking about a drunk easel. I don't give a shit about the easel, right? But all of a sudden, you're like, oh, yeah, that easel is a bit tipped over. Right? Oh, fuck, we are in this room, right? Oh, that is a painting of a sad Max Brenner. Um, you know, brings us into the room. That's the start of presence. And you can do this, you know, in a, in a workshop. Hey, guys, like, we're here for this thing. This is what we're doing, blah, 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 right? The mistake that we often make is we start here, right? Okay, guys, I'm Rich, and today we're here to work out how we're going to change our customer journey, right? But that's key information. While he's still thinking about those shoes he wants to buy, she's still worrying about the kids being sick, an old mate over here is wondering if he should shop the look of a designer too, right? <laughs> if you start vague, hey, blah, 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 <laughs> yeah. blah, 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 oh, yeah. blah, 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 oh, all right, now I'm listening. <laughs> then you can introduce yourself, then you can talk about why you're in the room. That's when people are present, right? And that's one way, that's a super easy way. There's another way that... Um, I've been getting people present, right? And that's through disruption. It's a really simple technique, but super effective. I, um, I designed this workshop as like an off-site for a giant telco that fires people every six months. And um, <laughs> doesn't really narrow it down. Um, <laughs> but basically, they're trying to get people in that growth mindset, right? This is what we want people to think, feel, behave afterwards. All right, cool. But I knew that if we just brought people into the room and started teaching them skills, and they're going to come in an autopilot. In the same way that we walk into the same meeting room, sit in the same seats and drink the same cup of tea out of the same funny mug, right? We're just on autopilot. We're not really present. So I thought, let's disrupt these people. And so we end up with 500 people standing in the foyer of the, uh, whatever it is, the ICC. 
the CEOs out the front is like, all right, guys, just remember today, the more you put in, the more you get out, yada, yada, yada. We're going to go through these doors in a second. Just get with the program. 500 people waiting to walk in, hear an inspirational speaker talk about how if you, um, I don't know, apply yourself to the things that are hardest, then you'll become greater than you ever were before. Like, is this computer on? Yeah, it is cool. Anyway, so they walk in the room, 500 cushions in this giant circle, this little spotlight in the middle, and sitting in the middle is this dude. <laughs> this is the gong guru. This guy is next level weird, right? <laughs> hey guys, in you come, bang. <laughs> Take a seat, bang. Get down, I'm going to get on the didgeridoo and you're really going to feel the vibes, right? All these people who walked in here think they're going to sit down, take notes from an inspiring speaker. All of a sudden are going, what the fuck is going on here, right? <laughs> but when people are in that unknown environment, when they don't know what's going on, all of a sudden they're alert, they're awake and they're sensing. They're thinking about what's going on now or what's going to happen next, right? And by doing that, they become hyper-present. Like... It was classic and it was pretty fun when the guy's giving you a gong wash around the room and everyone's got their eyes closed. Um, but actually the point of resetting people, disrupting them, so when we did start the conference, they would be focused and they would be more aware. It was super effective in that way. And so that's something you can do as well. Book your next meeting in a different room. Trying to work on an interesting problem, take them somewhere, somewhere, I don't know, weird and wonky or fitting. Just change things up, disrupt people. And all of a sudden, they'll become present. I've got a bit to go through. I better speed up. Um, there's something really interesting. Actually, there's this thing. Has anyone seen that? There's a table that someone designed to create intimacy and presence. And it's two seats and a tabletop. But it's on a little rocker. And the only way that you can sit at the table is when you're sitting down with someone else. It's a really nice designing idea, right? What I like about that is that it's designed for presence. Um, the Umbrella Riots in Hong Kong are kind of like an innovation hub for protesting and social change, right? And they've been doing some really amazing things. When they first started in 2013, which is a long time ago now, they started communicating over this platform called FireChat, right? People would download this app and it became this kind of virtual network, kind of sat secondary to the internet, right? And the only way it worked is if a bunch of people downloaded the FireChat built that network and then they could communicate over that. And in doing that, they created a platform where by design, people had to be present in order for it to work. It's a little bit like sitting at that table, right? All of a sudden, if you're not there, the whole thing falls over. It's kind of, it's a little bit tricky, it's a little bit different. What they're doing now is um, they've gone like su super flat in terms of their hierarchy. There is no leader, right? No one wants to get their head chopped off. And so, all decisions are being made through this distributed network, right? Live. So if you get on Telegram in Hong Kong, right, there's people suggesting what we're going to do, right? People are deciding, right, these are the shortlist. Everyone votes. Here's how we're going to do it. This is the plan. This is where we're doing it. Boom. And then they're off, right? And so again, in order to participate in this movement, you need to be there. You need to be present. You need to be part of it. And that's another really interesting way to build presence. But the thing that ties all these things together is that you're pulling people in, right? You're not dictating presence because that doesn't really work. When you want authentic energy, you need to create, you need to channel people's energy in a way that's meaningful, in a way that they actually want to participate in. So that's presence, right? Behaviours are, they're kind of group norms in action, right? We're super social creatures, you know? If you've ever gotten an elevator and realised that everyone's facing this, it doesn't matter which way they face, right? You just follow suit. There's this really interesting experiment where they get four people in a room. Three of them are plants, one of them is legit. And they show them coloured cards, right? Hold up a blue card, the first person, purple. Second person, it looks purple. Third person, yeah, it's purple. Fourth person, blue, right? All right, here's another card. Purple, purple, purple. Blue? Another card. Purple, purple, purple. Purple, right? <laughs> People change. We adjust to the behaviours around us, right? We're super social in the way. And that's why it's such an important 
um, thing to bring in when you're trying to create that sense of flow. Because when people know the rules and the way that people behave, all of a sudden engaging becomes a little bit more predictable. If you think about an orchestra, right? Everyone's following the music, you know when to jump in with your violin. Right? If everyone's just jamming away, playing their own songs, it's fucking chaos. Really hard to know what to do next. I think they call it jazz, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but by creating behaviours, showing people this is how we behave around here, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit safer for people to engage. Comedians do it in kind of explicit and implicit ways, right? Hey, phones away, don't talk to your friends, be seated while the acts are on stage, that kind of stuff. Um, but if you've ever been in a gig where a comedian gets heckled, like, it's basically, this is how we behave in here, right? Because essentially what happens, a lot of people maybe don't realise this, but comedians say stuff to try and get a heckle out of people just so they can show them, I'm the boss around here, you'll respect me, right? Um, <laughs> I used to get heckled by Scottish people all the time. Um, I don't know why, it's like the shape of my head annoys them or something, right? <laughs> But the thing is, when you're doing gig in Aberdeen, they've got a pretty thick accent, right? It's really hard to know what they're saying. And so I just, I ha end up writing a line, where, you know, you get heckled by someone Scottish. What's that, mate? You, are you Scottish? Yeah, yeah, hey, pal. What are you doing here, mate? It's way past your life expectancy. <laughs> Not a great joke, right? But a real nice zinger, that means no other Scots in the room are going to have a go at me now. I've showed everyone that you heckle me, you're going to go down, right? And I actually heard something way better that made me think about that put down. Um, my girlfriend's a nurse and she was in a meeting and, um, and one of the doctors was reading out a name of a patient. Oh, and so we also need to see Mr. Tilikura. Yeah, you know, you know what, I'm, you get the idea. And one of her colleagues goes, well, that sounds like ca casual racism to me. <laughs> oh, that is a fucking boss move, right? <laughs> you know from now on, everyone's practicing every patient's name before they walk into that meeting, right? And that's showing everyone these are the behaviours that we accept here. And so that's something that's really easy to do, right? Wait for someone to come in late into your workshop or meeting, go... Hey, Paul, I thought we said this was going to be important. What are you doing on a slate? You've got to do it with good humour, otherwise you sound like a prick. But, um, <laughs> you know, show, exhibit the norms that are, um, that are accepted in this space and you'll create a space where behaviour becomes predictable and flow is kind of something that people can engage in. Um, something else that I've d started doing, which I think is super important or super effective, is in kind of organisational settings, uh, introducing a team metaphor to kind of explain how we're going to behave. I was running this uh, accelerated workshop, it was like nine weeks, all these people working together. And I asked everyone, told them, had the first day, talked about what the project was, said, tomorrow can you all come in with, an with a metaphor for our group, how we're going to work. And a lot of them were not very good, but this one guy fucking nailed it, right? He goes, I think we're like mountain climbers. You know, we've got a big mountain ahead of us, it's cloudy, we can't really see where we're going. We've never climbed this mountain before, but if we keep putting one foot in front of another, we'll get there. We're tied to each other, so we're relying on each other. Rich, you're like our Sherpa, our guide. We know you will get us there. Right. <laughs> Come here. Right. That is perfect, right? Because what you've got then is a set of behaviours that everybody understands without you having to go, Paul, I thought I said to put your phone away. You get to go, Paul, we're on the mountain. Do you think you should be texting? Oh, no, no, I can't. Right. <laughs> super simple, super easy. Um, what happens in movements? A lot of the time you're getting a whole lot of people. How long have I got? Ten? All right, cool. Um, Okay, with movements, you end up with a whole lot of people in one space that maybe don't really know each other. Maybe there's not as like strongly exhibited group norms, right? Because it's the first time they've come together. Big protests, we're going to march, what are we going to do, right? A big part of um, passive activism, which is kind of how we play in the social change space at the moment, is training people up. I was sitting down with the guys from the school strike for climate 
summer or March, and um, they were telling me they actually had 100 people in a room practising, this is how fast we're going to walk. These are the kind of chants we're going to engage with. If anyone does this, this is how you respond, right? And what happens is then they get dotted all throughout the protest. Everyone knows, oh, cool, it seems like we're all walking about this fast. Oh, they joined in on this chant. Maybe I'll join in on this chant too, right? Oh, that guy's smashing the window with a baseball bat. Oh, but he's getting told off, let's not smash any more windows, right? We start looking around for these social cues and in doing so, we kind of create a space where behaviour becomes predictable and we can all engage. And because people come to these new, um, I guess, projects, new scenarios, new challenges, um, with anxieties, it's really important to kind of reduce those anxieties as much as you can and having consistent behaviour is how we do that. So, yeah. And so that is a big part of flow. The last thing I want to talk about is tension, right? I'm going to talk about it quite quickly. Um, <laughs> so you've got people, you know, they're present, they understand how they're going to behave. Tension is kind of the fuel for the fire, right? And tension is that gap between where we are and where we need to be, right? It's super simple right? as humans we're we're drawn to these to tension right to resolving tension you know if i stand here i go what's uh four plus five again everyone's like i know it mate you know it's very difficult to ignore that prompt right that's how our brain works and so when you have a valid point to start with and a point to get to then all of a sudden you create the right conditions for change uh, for flow now comedians are really good at talking about where we are, right? This is the point. Because the thing is you need to agree where you are because if not, everyone's stepping off in another direction, chasing their own little ideas, their own little initiatives, attacking their own problems, right? But when you know where you are, you're in a great point to start, right? That's why you always hear this thing, right? <laughs> it's funny because it's true, right? Comedians are amazing at pointing out where we are right now. There's this great... I'm not, I've got a clip here. I'm not going to play it. We can play it later if there's time. I don't think there's time. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit sweary. Um, and it's also from 10 years ago. A little bit of context. So um, I was trying to write jokes about important social issues. I would talk about important social issues. No one would really laugh, right? I was really close to these issues. Don't you think we should all be getting public transport instead of driving, eh? Am I right? Nah. So what I had to do is apply different lenses to these topics, right? And by stepping away from what I believed and what I thought was important and thinking about it from where other people were, all of a sudden it gave me a new spin on these important issues. This is a joke that I wrote. Um, yeah, excuse the swearing. But here's the thing, right? Climate change, right? A lot of people are getting really far. Roger was going off about it, but you see pe people go mental about it, you know, and there's people that watch five minutes of the Discovery Channel, right? Which is an interesting name for a channel that just shows you stuff someone else already knows, right? They, they tune into this for five minutes, so, oh, the polar bears. <laughs> They're dying. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. <laughs> is it? A tragedy? Fuck them. <laughs> I've never seen a polar bear. I don't think I ever will. And maybe if those polar bears were delivering my pizzas and Chinese takeaway, then you'd have some fucking action, wouldn't you? I just think this whole global warming thing's kind of good, right? It's kind of like a common enemy that brings the rest of us together. You know, it's like a shit job. How much better does everyone else get along when there's one person in the office you all fucking hate? <laughs> Look, I, um, I didn't finish those reports, but um, <laughs> isn't Brian a cunt? No? <laughs> oh. And that thing is, I could deal with it as well. If climate change, if the only issue was climate change, then I could deal with these fucking hippies. But it's not. It's fucking everything we do. You know, we get told we've got to use less packaging. That's bullshit. Nature's the worst packager of the lot, isn't it? That's who we've taken our lead from. Think about it, right? You get bananas that come individually wrapped. <laughs> You know, you've got oranges in separate little segments, then all wrapped up again. I mean, onions, it's nothing fucking but, is it? It's just layer after layer after layer. You get to the middle, let's fuck all there. 
You know, you got eggs wrapped in shells, chicken in feathers, steak in suede. Yeah, think about it. It's not just food either. You've got trees wrapped in bark, islands in sand, the whole earth in one big bloody atmosphere. Thing is, that's the packaging we're working on, isn't it? We're getting rid of the atmosphere, aren't we? Hey? We're burning through the ozone layer. We're skinning animals. We're clearing forests. We're doing our bit. We're getting rid of ice from the Arctic, coral from the reef, and islands from the Pacific. But are these hippies happy? Are they fuck? It's bullshit. I can't even fill up my car without getting a guilt trip. That's fucked, right? Because I'm a traditionalist, all right? I like my fossil fuels, okay? I like to know that someone's been killed or at the very least exploited to get me from A to B. I don't want to fill up my car with fucking sunflower oil. Fuck that. We get to use fossil fuels because we're top of the ladder. The minute we start bowing to nature, we've lost. That's why we've got to drive trucks, eat meat and burn shit. And really, I don't think we've gained true ascendancy till we start fueling our cars with vegetarians. <laughs> we don't need the environment to survive. That's bullshit, man. The only reason we don't eat rocks is because Jamie Oliver hasn't showed us how to prepare them. So yeah, I used to be funny. Um, <laughs> but I guess I had something that was quite close to me, right, that I really wanted to talk about, but other people couldn't, like, wouldn't buy into it. By just discussing the topics around it, pointing out the connection between our actions and the overall impact, but in a funny way, all of a sudden everyone could come to the party. Um, and, uh, yeah. and so when you're trying to establish that starting point, empathising with other people, seeing it from their point of view is a really powerful way to start articulating in a way that everyone can agree on. It doesn't always work like that when you're in an organisation because people have got their own priorities, heaps of problems, a uh, couple of opportunities and no trust, right? No one really wants to solve someone else's problem. I've got the most important problem, right? Something I've been using is this metaphor of an amplifier, right? We have got heaps of problems, right? And there's always problems, right? You solve that problem, there's another problem right underneath and underneath that. It's like digging a hole, right? But there's also opportunities, you know, things that are working, things that we can amplify. And when you lay all these things out and start to show people, well, we could turn this one down, but that's going to be a bit hard to turn down. Maybe we can turn this one up. We already like each other out of work. Can we bring that into it? Those kind of things, you start to show, I guess how these things correlate and where the best use of energy will be. And that's a really interesting way because you're not getting everyone to agree that this is the most problem, this most important problem, but this is the most impactful problem or solution that we can work on right now. Um, and the other thing that, I guess, in that organisational sense um, is thinking about outcomes, not outputs. You've probably heard about this. Um, outputs are the thing, outcomes are the value the thing creates. Right? When you can elevate the uh, the place that you're trying to get to, to an outcome, it does two things, right? All of a sudden, you're not trying to come up with five ideas to test with customers. You're trying to come up with an idea that helps customers, whatever, adopt your mobile phone easier, right? Whatever that outcome is. Um, and in doing so, you do two things. One, you stop dictating to people how they need to succeed within this space. That's a really empowering thing for people when you're trying to get them in that flow state. The other thing you do is as a facilitator, if that's your role, you start to, you can open up the different avenues to achieving that outcome. And so all of a sudden, if the energy is not in writing down idea forms or it's not in the post-it note exercise over here, you can work out where is that energy and go and focus on that energy, come up with an exercise that feeds into that because that's a more effective way to get to the outcome that you want. And, and you can only do that when you're not tied to the outputs. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed this in the news. It's kind of a change in narrative around drug testing at festivals. Um, I was interviewing a guy who runs a harm minimization movement and um, he was telling me about this idea of death-free festivals, right? Drug-free festivals, they sound good, right? But if you elevate that to a point, this is the outcome, right? The death-free festivals. All of a sudden... 
by elevating what you're trying to achieve, you end up with something that's super emotive and it's like inarguable. Even if you agree with this, this is a higher order of that. And when people have these kind of open goals, these open places that we're trying to get to, it makes it super accessible. And so when you're running a social movement, trying to get a whole lot of people from a whole lot of places to contribute and feed into the progress you're trying to make, having these kind of lofty but emotive outcomes are super important for attracting people. Um, and so that's it, right? If you can agree on where you are, you all take a step from the same place. If you care about where you want to be, then you're drawn to that point. And when you have those two things, that is when people can really lean into the flow. And so the conditions for flow, we talked about this presence, behaviours and tension. Actually what we want to do is pull people into that state of presence. Demonstrate the behaviours so that everybody understands the norms and can engage in a safe way and align on where we are and go to a place that you actually want to end up. Right? Because when we do these things, we create the, spe the space and the conditions for people to lean in, for people to exchange information and for people to get into the flow. And when we get into the flow, that is when we create this, this shared knowledge, this shared understanding, and that is how we're going to solve the big problems in our world. What you can do is prototype these things, have a little dinner party. Hey guys, it's Saturday night and you're sitting at my dinner table and everyone's next to someone that they've only just met. Oh yeah, that's so true, right? Do these things in a low risk situation so you feel comfortable, right? Practice these things. Next time you're in a meeting, call someone out. Hey, if you're on your phone, you're not really engaged in this conversation. Oh, all right, I understand, right? Show those norms to the group. And when you feel confident, when you know that you understand how to start creating the conditions for flow, go and find that problem that you care about, that injustice in the world, the thing that you want to change. Because when you know what that is and when you understand that outcome and you can bring people to the table and agree on where you are, that, that is the condition for us to make this a better world. And if we don't solve these massive problems, at least you're going to know how to warm up a crowd for some jokes about the impending apocalypse. <laughs> cool. Uh, that's my talk, guys. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me, I'm going to be here for a while. Um, let's hang out on LinkedIn. And um, if you want to listen to my podcast, it's How to Start a Riot. It's on Spotify and iTunes. Um, if you're working on something that is big and lofty, you want to talk about it, um, hit me up because... I think sometimes it's really hard to take those first few steps, but if I get to help you do that, then that's a super exciting prospect for me. Cool. That's it. Cheers. <laughs>
amplification effect, and that is really what protests are about. So, what's the question? Um, <laughs> how did I identify a change and align people on where we wanted to go to? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right, cool. So, how do I go from um, the change that I want to see to a group of people who also want to see that change? How do I get from zero to 100? Well, zero to one is the hard bit, right? Um, so I think it's helpful to not really care that much. Um, if you become too emotionally invested in an issue, it becomes inaccessible to other people. Oh, maybe we should do this. Oh, you just don't understand, all right? There are complexities to this, right? You need to be open. You need to understand, really think about what's the outcome that you want to create. Because all of a sudden that opens up the conversation and so other people can come into that conversation. You say, you know, something that I tried to do unsuccessfully um, was think about how I built a more compassionate society, right? How can we build a more compassionate Australia? How can we stop turning around helpless people who are on a dodgy boat floating here for safety? How can we stop turning them around and actually go, hey, things are pretty good. Maybe we should reach out and help these people, right? I didn't know how to do it, right? That's a big challenge. But I read this thing that um, talks about uh, Australian sociologist, I can't remember his name. He talks about uh, the health of a country can be measured by the health of its community. And so I thought, what can I do locally? Right? I guess this is probably a better answer. Think about what you're capable of with the skills and assets and resources you have. Because what I did was, it's a bit dodgy, but I started a bar in my garage for the people in my building as a way to connect to them, right? Super fun, probably not like really above board, but quite effective in creating a community where I lived. Um, but what you do is when you start with something, then people are attracted to it, right? It actually started with the veggie garden, right? And I put up a sign and met a few people said, hey, if you want to plant something, put it in here. All of a sudden, people are like, oh, yeah, maybe I can chuck a few seeds in there. Oh, I, I watered the garden for you, right? And people start to rally around this thing. If you have something tangible, it doesn't matter how shit it is, you've started, right? And that's what people believe in. You can talk all day, and that's a problem with a lot of these movements and a lot of our organisations is we spend a lot of time talking and not much time doing, right? But if you create that one asset that people can rally around and they can contribute to in a way that they want to, like, that's a really powerful way to start getting from zero to 100. Um, there's a couple of interesting things, right? I heard about this one way. If you're doing a remote call, make everyone dial in remote because then everyone's on an even playing field, right? These are the accepted behaviours. You're going to have to talk through a webcam, wait for your turn. We'll be able to see how you engage. But I actually think the best way to do it is it's all about trust and relationships, right? That's how we start to create that communication. Right? And this is the same if you're working remote or you're in a workshop with colleagues, right? If you walk in there and go, hey, how about the, how about the weather out there today, right? Or oh, isn't parking a nightmare around here? Like that is some real bottom shelf chat you're pulling out right there, right? And with that level of chat, it's really hard to exchange meaningful information. The way we build trust is by starting to exchange meaningful information. So if you can start with something interesting, talk about something that is different, that brings a bit more of that circle to the conversation that's when you can build those relationships and that's when you can start to get to that state of flow a little bit quicker. You know, ask them where they got their shoes, tell them did they see that sign down the road, like start the conversation from here, not from here, and you'll start building that trust much faster. Cool. Any other questions?
any more? Maybe one more? How did I know his name was Brian? <laughs> Sorry, I'm really confused by that. that I'll take that as a comment. Uh, <laughs> I think it is because, like, when we think about social movements, obviously we always talk about that kind of purist mindset, right? You know? Don't lecture me about climate change. You wear shoes. Like, that's, that's kind of the common approach, right? But there, um, there are ways that we can work with the system around us in order to achieve good. And I think it's quite um, idealistic to think that we can just change the world in one fell swoop without acknowledging the things around us. We talk about using the assets that we have in order to create change. Business, growth, profits, they're all um, mechanisms at play that can drive impact, right? You could go and work for a tiny NGO with three people and do their EDM campaigns, right? That's a really important thing to do. But equally, you could go and work for a big fuck-off telco that fires people every six months and start having conversations about you know, the way that we improve the lives of our customers. What are our social obligations? Um, the interesting space in between is social enterprise, which is a really interesting... There's a lot of different ways it plays out, but it t essentially ties the success of a business to the impact that you're trying to create. And so if you can identify the kind of impact that you want to have, the outcome that you're trying to achieve and how you measure it, and understand a customer need in the market, then you can bring those two together to create meaningful impact and change, and then you can get rich and do good stuff too. Um, I also think that right now, that's what we're all trying to do. Um, you know, I want to change the world, but I also want my soy latte before I go to work, right? So, yes, it's irony, but don't let the irony stop you. People always say, well, what's the point? You know, there's no point in whatever, bring my keep cup because I still get on a plane. If you don't think you can do... If you don't think that achieves enough, don't do less, do more. Um, so yeah, that's it. Cool.